I don't know about you guys, but roller coaster adventure services are my favorite kind. We just never know what's going to come up. So if the notes keep going, they keep going. If they don't, you guys are just stuck listening to me, I guess. So if you guys have your Bibles, open them up to the book of Hebrews chapter 3. I have been immensely challenged in my study of the book of Hebrews to this point, especially coming through this chapter, because we are presented with not only the fact that Christ is greater, but because of Christ's greatness, we're called to something greater ourselves. We're called to a holy calling, a higher calling, a divine calling, where we get to serve and walk alongside Jesus as His representatives. That is a high calling, is it not? Like, I don't think we can fully comprehend the immensity of that calling in our finite minds. The magnitude of opportunity that Christ has placed before us. And you know what? There are times in our life where I will just say it is so easy not to trust God. Would you guys agree with that statement? There are times in our life where it is just easy to not trust God. Think about a time in your life where you didn't trust God. Everybody got one? should take you about 30 seconds because we're human, okay? Or even three seconds or three milliseconds. But there's times where, you know, how many of you guys have ever been in a difficult time? And rather than turning to God, you said, you know what, I'm going to figure this out on my own. We've all been there, right? How many of you guys have ever, maybe in a time where life is good, you've got things under control. And so you don't really need God. And so you just kind of go it alone, right? Now, I'm not saying we, we tangibly think, I don't need God. That's not what I'm saying. But we just, we can live that way, right? We can live as though... We don't need God because everything's good. I think this is a problem in the North American church. Can I just say that? We have abundance, do we not? Like, look, every Thursday my fridge is full. Every Thursday my fridge is full because we go grocery shopping. How do we get to the grocery store? We drove there in the car we have. Where we put our groceries in the house that we own. Right? We have abundance. And it's easy sometimes to not trust God because we really think we have enough in this life. Or maybe we have a hard time trusting God because we really don't trust in the the sufficiency of Christ, the strength of Christ, the power of God to work in and through our situations. Right? Maybe there's a bit of doubt in our lives. And you know what? There's not one of us in this room that's exempt from that. Do you guys realize that? We are all human beings. We are all fallible. We are still a work in progress. But it's so easy sometimes to not trust God. To simply live life saying we follow Christ, but really not surrendering to Him. You know what? Deva, a couple of years ago, shared a story of when we were roofing in, uh, in a small little northern town called Armstrong. Metropolis, actually. It's a bustling metropolis. <laughs> the end of the road. Like, literally, it's the end of the road. Uh, and uh, so we, we, had, uh, we had roofed a, a, a camp up there and spent the weekend, and, and uh, we went to take all the shingles to the dump. And uh, in the process of packing up and getting ready to go, you guys have, if you guys remember the story, I put my Apple Watch on the, on the spare tire of the, the car. And, and I just remember, and the reason I'm sharing this story uh, is because when Dave shared it, it was a huge testimony of praise to how much God cares, even about the little things. But you know what, to be honest with you, when, when, when we realized that, that my watch was left on the back of the, the trailer and we, we had no idea where it was, I'm on my phone trying to get a, a signal to, to go to it so it's making noise when we find it. We drove all the way back to the camp, realized it wasn't there, slowly went along the road, wasn't there, and so we figured it had to be someplace between the end of the pavement and the Armstrong dump, which is a few kilometers up the dirt road. And, uh, and so Dave said, let's pray. And I remember thinking as Dave prayed, like, you know, God's good, but there is not a chance that this, <laughs> this little electronic device is going to survive. And you know what? But I said, let's just, we'll go and we'll drive. And, and as we're driving, I mean, dirt bikes and quads and side-by-sides are just tearing by us on this dirt road. And I thought, even if it's on the dirt road, the poor little thing's going to be in pieces. I'm going to find a strap to a watch and that's going to be it. <laughs> And, uh, and as we drove and drove and drove, uh, you know, every little piece of garbage looks like an Apple Watch at that point in time. And anyways, we, we, I look up and there's this little black strip laying in the road. 
and there it was, my Apple Watch, in one piece. Oh, wow. With quad and motorbike tracks all around it, but not there. And I felt like it was just like God saying, watch this. Yeah. <laughs> watch this, you of little faith. You know, I didn't even have to get out of a boat in a storm. God's just like, uh-huh. You know what I'm saying? Right there. If God, if God was like a taunter, he'd probably say, read them and weep right there, buddy. That's it. We got this. You see, but, but when I'm reminded of that story, sometimes I'm reminded of the fact that I didn't really fully believe that God was capable. And that's a detriment to my, my faith. There, I remember a time when our piano teacher was uh, passing away with cancer and we were praying for her. I prayed that God would bring healing to her life. And in the back of my mind, I said, but I don't think you can. See, that's, that's the seed of unbelief. That is the, the seed that Satan likes to plant within our minds that, say, that, that says to us over and over again, God really can't. God can't. Or even worse, God won't do this for you. And, and see, this is, this is the seed that, that he loves to plant in the life of every single believer. To question the ability of God, the power of God, the authority of God in our lives. And you know what? It has consequences if we let that seed grow. And this is where the author of Hebrews is going this morning. He's going to take us to this, this place where we have to be challenged as believers. If we're going to believe Christ is greater, even than the angels, Christ is greater than Moses, then we have to. We have to be able to believe that he is able. And if we turn to Psalm 78 this morning, Psalm 78, we looked last week, last week excuse me, at the... At the at the example that Israel set for us, right? Was it a good one? No. Israel was, was basically almost mocked, if you will, because of their unbelief. And the author uses Israel as, a, as an example of what we should not do as believers, right? He says, didn't they walk right up to the promised land? They sent in some spies and ten of them came back and were like, we're all going to die if we go in there, guys. Like it's going to be a massacre, a slaughter. And Caleb and Joshua are like, we got this. And so what happened as a result? They had to walk for 40 years until that generation, that unbelieving generation, passed. You see, in Psalm chapter 78, starting in verse 11, it says, They forgot His works and the wonders that He had shown them. Oh, how easy we forget. Right? Mm -hmm. How easy we forget. In the sight of their fathers, he performed wonders in the land of Egypt. In the fields of Zon, he divided the sea and let them pass through it and made the water stand like a heap. In the daytime, he led them with a the cloud all and all night with a fiery light. He split rocks in the wilderness and gave them drink abundantly as from the deep. He made streams come out of the rock and caused waters to flow down like rivers. Yet... They sin still more against him, rebelling against the Most High. They tested God in their heart by demanding the food they craved. You guys are like, I love when, when the Bible's just real. Not that God hadn't provided for them. They wanted what they wanted. And by golly, they were going to get it. And they were going to complain until they did. They spoke against God saying, Can God spread a table in the wilderness? He struck the rock and water gushed out and streams overflowed. Can he also provide meat for his people? And the, and the psalmist here is recounting the, the, the rebellious heart of the nation of Israel. Therefore the Lord heard, when the Lord heard, he was full of wrath. His fire was kindled against Jacob. His anger rose against Israel because they did not, what's the word there? Believe, Believe God and did not trust in his saving power. That is an indictment, is it not? Against the nation of Israel. They did not believe God and did not trust in His saving power. You see, the devil planted the seed of unbelief, not just in one, but in many. 
of the nation of Israel. And you know what happened? It spread like wildfire. To the point where the nation complained against God in spite of all that God had done. They got hung up on maybe something they didn't have instead of all the abundance that God had provided. When, we read, when I read about the nation of Israel in the Old Testament, how many of you guys go, hey, that sounds a lot like me? Right? We're good for a little bit, and then we fall off the bandwagon for some reason. We're good for a little bit, we fall off the bandwagon. God does some correction, we get back on board, we're good for a little bit, we fall off the bandwagon. This is, this is the, the, the story of humanity. You see, but what we need to understand is that we cannot doubt, right? If we look at James chapter 1, verses 5 through 8, it says, If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God. How many of you guys lack wisdom? All of us. There's not a person who says, Hey, I'm good. I got all the wisdom in the world. You know who had all the wisdom in the world? Solomon. And the guy still married more than one woman. If any of you lacks wisdom, you know what I mean? Like, Ask God, he'll give you more. Solomon needed a little bit more when he started doing that. But anyways, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God who gives generously without reproach and it will be given to him. You know what he says? God's not going to play favorites and give more wisdom to, the, to you over you. He says, no, if you ask God, he will give it and he will give it generously. Verse six, but let him ask in faith with no doubting. For the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. For that person must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. So if we go to God and we say, God, I need wisdom, but we don't believe God can give us wisdom, why should we expect that God's going to give us wisdom? He won't. In fact, the, the James goes on to say, that person who says, I need something from God, but doesn't believe that God is capable of doing it, is double-minded. They say one thing, they believe another. Is that a spider? <laughs> I'm like, that thing is going up and down. That is not a normal bug. <laughs> For all of you who love spiders, you're welcome. Nope. Okay. I don't like spider. It's probably going to rain now. You got spider guts on me. Okay, but anyways, he says, you are a double-minded person. You think one thing and say another. And he says, this is dangerous because you have no grounding in your life. You're like that wave that is just at the, 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 the mercy of the, 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 the elements. The wave doesn't control where it goes. What controls where the wave goes? The winds and the storms. We must not doubt. And when you look at Scripture, look at Scripture. Read your Bibles. And you know what you will find? Is that Israel wasn't alone in their unbelief. Look at the church of Galatia. After his introduction, what does Paul say? I marvel. I am amazed that you are so quickly removed from the gospel. It's like Paul says, hey, it's me. Paul draws out his sword and says, let's dance. Because you have left the gospel. And this is a problem. And you have left the gospel for works. For a righteousness that doesn't come by faith, but by what you do. And that will fail every time. If you look at, at the, the, the Corinthian church, did they not lose sight of, of what was sound doctrine and good teaching? Yeah, they allowed worldliness to creep in. They allowed worldliness to come into their church and it defiled it. You look at the church of Ephesus, right? Go to, go to the book of Revelation. Church of Ephesus had it all going on. Everything was right. And he says, I have this against you that you have left your first love. If you look, continue down through there, you have the church of Pergamum that allowed false teachers and teaching and false teaching into the church. The church of Thyatira was led into temptation and sexual immorality. The church of Laodicea was lukewarm. And the, what was the indictment there? You're neither hot nor cold, but lukewarm, and I want to vomit you from my mouth. Those are the words of Christ. Do you see the real danger of unbelief here? Israel fell prey to it. The church fell prey to it. And so we cannot sit here this morning and go, ah, that's never going to happen to me. Because as soon as we say that, guess what? The devil's like, target. Let's go. Hey guys, we've got to desert some troops over here because we got a weak flank. This is our end to the church. We're going to plant a seed of doubt in this person and it's going to spread. You see, it's easy for us to lose sight of the Word of God and sound doctrine. It's also easy for us to lose sight of practically applying the
the sound doctrine that we so dearly cling to. Do we need sound doctrine? Mm-hmm. Let me tell you what, if sound doctrine, and all it is is sound doctrine, whoop de doo Now, I'm not saying don't take that the wrong way. Please don't sound bite that on the internet. What I am saying is if all we have is sound doctrine, but that doesn't ever translate into reality in our lives, it means nothing. It's words on a page. It's an academic practice. It means nothing. It has to come into our minds and then transform our lives and that way we live it out daily. And it's easy to neglect the application and living out of God's words. Why? Because we can become complacent, can't we? We can become comfortable. We can suffer in our life because we don't trust God's abilities 100%. I want to read the quote that I read last week from Albert Moley. He says, The urgency remains for us in our current context just as it did for the original audience. Today is the day of decision. Today we will either walk with God or we will walk away from God. Today is the day of decision. Every day that we have breath in our lungs is the day of decision. Either we walk with God or we walk away from God. There's no middle ground. You're either walking with Him or you're walking away from Him. And so that brings us to Hebrews chapter 3, verse 12. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 12. Take care, brothers, lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart leading you to fall away from the living God. Now, I think we could spend the rest of the morning picking apart this verse. And he starts by saying this, take care. How many of you guys ever said this to somebody? Take care. And really, what are you saying? See you later. (laughs) Right? And it's kind of this this kind of cliche saying we say, well, I, I hope you have a good rest of your day. Hope nothing bad happens. Okay. I want to say this. When Paul said, or the author of Hebrews says, take care, he is not saying, have a nice day. If we look at this in the Greek, the word is, is kind of an interesting one. Bleepy. <laughs> see, it just means see, okay? But it has this sense here to be vigilant, to be on the lookout, to be careful. So the author of Hebrews, after saying how great Christ is, how great, how, how great Christ is in comparison to Moses, he then goes to say, look at Israel's bad example, and then he says, let's get real, church. You need to be aware, you need to be sober-minded, you need to be vigilant, because there is a real possibility that you could have an unbelieving heart. And look at how he describes it. An evil, unbelieving heart. You know what he does when he takes that word evil and he puts it in there? He ascribes an aspect of morality to unbelief. It's not just this, oh, I believe or I don't believe. No, to to not believe in God when you know God is evil. To not trust God when you know God, it is evil. Do you see how he just ratchets up the intensity of this? He says, guys, this is not not a joke. This is not something we can be, oh, yeah, I I believe. (laughs) Yeah, I really don't. No, he says, look at it for what it is. This is a ploy from the enemy. And it is evil. Isn't that what he says in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8? Be sober-minded, be watchful. Same exhortation. Be watchful, have your eyes open, be on the lookout, be careful. Why? Because your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Now, I know you know that verse. But who is the one that's on the prowl? The enemy, our adversary, the one who is going out against us, looking for opportunity to destroy us. He is active in his pursuit of the children of God. Can I just say that? He is active in his pursuit of the children of God. And so the author of Hebrews, knowing this, says, look, you need to take care. You need to be aware of what the devil's schemes are. Because the devil loves nothing more. The devil loves nothing more than an ignorant Christian. One who does not know the word of God. One who does not understand the truth. The one who does not live the word of God. He loves them. Because your mind and your life becomes a playground that he likes to frolic in. And he just likes to sow the seeds of doubt and destruction in your life. And what the author of Hebrews says is, open your eyes. Live in reality. Live in reality. We are all capable of unbelief. And unbelief leads to sin. And he says, look at the chosen people of God. 
the nation of Israel, they did not sin because they believed God. They sinned because they didn't believe God. You guys catch that? They sinned because they didn't believe God. You guys realize when we sin, when we choose to sin in our life, it's because we don't really believe God. Maybe in that area. But I also want to say this. There are people who say, well, he's talking to unbelievers here. A believer can't have an, an unbelieving heart. Let me tell you what, if we go back to Hebrews chapter 3, verse 1, what does it say? Therefore, holy brothers, you who share the heavenly calling, consider Jesus. In the beginning of this chapter, contextually, he's talking to the church. Followers of Jesus Christ. He calls them brothers. Those who share the heavenly calling. It's not, he, no, no, no. He has not switched gears. It's not all of a sudden he got to verse 12 and says, let's talk about unbelievers who might attend your church. No, he's talking to the church. The Bible Knowledge Commentary says this, each Christian brother therefore should be most careful to guard against a sinful, unbelieving heart which God's flock in the wilderness displayed, the kind of heart that turns, that turns away from the living God. Open your eyes. Take care. Be watchful. You know what? I, I just thought to myself, maybe, there's, maybe in our lives, we're just not careful enough. It's interesting because sometimes we sit down. Any of you guys ever sit down to, to watch a show at night? Movie, occasionally? You would not believe how many times in the past couple months I've said, oh, we should watch that movie. I remember it being really good. Turn that off. Right? Because back in, maybe in the day when I was less mature and I just let stuff come in the floodgates, and then you go back and you're like, I do not want my children listening to that. I do not want my children seeing that. I feel bad that I watched that. I feel bad that I recommended that. You, guys, you see what I'm saying? As we grow in Christ, we should also grow in our awareness of what is good for us and what is not good for us. And you know what? Sometimes, maybe, we need to have our eyes and our hearts and our minds open and we need to maybe give up something. Maybe we need to give up a show that we love because it speaks to the immorality of our culture. Maybe we need to get rid of an app that we spend way too much time on. You know what? I, I deleted, I'm, I'm not saying this to brag, I deleted Facebook and Instagram off my phone, the app. I'll tell you what, man. It is so good without Facebook and Instagram. I'm just saying, like, I, I mean, don't get me wrong. I think they're powerful tools. I think they can be good. But, but man, to not feel like I have to open an app and look at something for no apparent reason, it's a freeing thing. Maybe we just need to give up stuff like that and only use it when it's necessary. Maybe for, for some, we, we need to give up a friendship that's pulling us away from Christ that isn't beneficial for us. Maybe we need to give up something we're looking at that nobody knows we're looking at. Maybe we need to give up pornography or gambling or whatever it is. And, and sometimes maybe we just need to put up boundaries in our life. Allow, allow God to have our time and, and dictate what we use it for. And that includes who and what we're allowing in our life. You see, we have to be careful because it's so easy to let stuff in. And let me tell you what, when we let stuff in that God does not approve of, that's where Satan can plant his seed of unbelief. Hebrews chapter 13, or 3 verse 13 says, this is how you combat the possibility of unbelief. You combat unbelief with fellowship. I love this. But exhort one another every day, as long as it is called today, that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. Exhort one another. The exhortation here is that we mutually encourage one another so that we may keep the faith. So the author of Hebrews draws this conclusion. If you want to stay away from an unbelieving, evil heart, before God, you get together with other believers who are going to love you, who are going to care for you, who are going to lift you up, and sometimes who are going to encourage you by telling you the things that you need to hear, not what you want to hear. Now, I think there are times where we just need to hear God is still faithful. Amen? Amen. And we need people to come and say, you know what, I know you're in a rough spot, I know you're going through a hard time, and God is still with you. And I'm praying for you. I'm going to encourage you. You know what else we need sometimes? When we are not 
following Christ, when we are not living in accordance with his word. You know what we need? We need somebody to come up to us and say, you know what? I'm saying this because I love you, because I want what's best for you, because God wants what's best for you. You need to knock it off. What you are doing is sinful and wrong. The way that you are thinking is sinful and wrong. The way that your attitude is is sinful and wrong. Do you see? And you know what? I tell you what, I have benefited so much in my life from people of God, <laughs> godly people, coming up to me and saying, you're not right. Did I like it at the time? Absolutely not. I left meetings fuming mad. And I went home and I thought about it and I prayed about it and I had to go back and say, you know what? You are right. The way I was handling that was not correct. The way I was thinking about that was not correct. And are we not called to put off the old man? If we read Ephesians chapter 4, starting in verse 17. Now this I say, the Apostle Paul says, in the Lord, you must no longer walk as Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. They are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardness of their heart. Do you catch that? Don't walk like the world. Don't live like the world. Why? Because their thinking is futile. Their understanding is darkened. They are alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to what? Their hardened heart. The world lives the way the world does because it doesn't know Jesus Christ. The world lives the way it does because its heart is hard to the gospel. Why as Christians should we ever want to look at the world and say, yep, that's how I want to live. If their hearts are darkened and their thinking is futile and their hearts are hard towards God, why would we want that? But that is not the way you learn Christ, he says in verse 20. Assuming that you heard about him, about him and were taught in him as the truth is in Jesus to put off your old self. Put off the old self which belongs to your formal manner of life and it's corrupt and is corrupt through deceitful desires and be renewed in the spirit of your minds and to put on the new self created in the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. Don't be like the world. Don't live like the world. In fact, put, if, if there's something in your life that is still associated with the world, get rid of it. Get it out of your life and put on the new, the new self created in Christ Jesus. Colossians chapter 3, verses 5 through 10. It says, Put to death, therefore, whatever is earthly in you. Do you guys catch the theme of Scripture? If it's not of God, get it out of your life. Well, that, that means I'm going to have to give up a lot of stuff. Good. We all make the mistake of holding on to things that don't really matter for far too long and far too tightly. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly within you. Now catch what he says here. Sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these things, the wrath of God is coming. I don't know about you, when Christ returns to take his church home before the tribulation, let me tell you where you don't want to be. You don't want to be doing something that displeases God. Not that that's going to affect, I think, whether you go, but man, how embarrassing would that be? I'm a servant of the Most High God. Oh, Jesus, you're here. Why don't we start living like this? Jesus is already here. Why don't we live as if he's watching and encouraging us and admonishing us? So he says, well, you may say, oh, I don't, I don't struggle with sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, covetousness. But he goes on, he says, but now you must put away them, or put them all away. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, obscene talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self. Well, you may not struggle with sexual immorality, but how many of you guys get mad? How many of you guys have told a lie? How many of you guys have told maybe a joke or something that you shouldn't have said or, or, or said something you shouldn't have said because it was obscene? But he says, put on the new self, which is being renewed in the knowledge after its creator. And so how do we do all this? Through the mutual encouragement of the body of Christ. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 23 to 25 talks about not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. Why? Because our aim and our ambition is to stir one another up. 
Stir one another up in love unto good works. You can't stir up somebody and encourage somebody, exhort somebody, admonish somebody if you're not with people. If you're not with the body of Christ, it's never going to happen. 1 Thessalonians 5.11 says, Therefore encourage one another and build one another up just as you are doing. Paul's exhortation to the church as he wrapped out his, his letter to the Thessalonians, he said, look, encourage one another. Build one another up. Ephesians 4 talks about the same thing, about how he's given prophets and evangelists, shepherds and teachers. For what purpose? To equip the saints for the work of the ministry and to the building up of the body of Christ. That's what he, his goal is. He says, look, God gave spiritual gifts to the church so the church can be encouraged, the church can be built up, the church can be prepared until we all come to maturity in Christ. Solomon said it well when he said in Proverbs 27, verse 17, iron sharpens iron and one man sharpens another. How do we combat unbelief? We surround ourselves with people who believe. So that way, when we get in a moment that's hard or difficult or we don't understand and we want to say, I don't know how God is ever going to, and somebody will stop us and say, you know what? But he will. Doesn't that just cut off unbelief right there in a moment? <laughs> like, uh, No, stop that thinking because it's wrong. You believe God or you don't believe God. There's no middle ground. You walk with God or you don't walk with God. But you know what? If we're allowed to sit by ourselves and wallow... How many of you guys have ever done this before? You stew. <laughs> you just sit in the stew pot and that thought that you had, maybe it was because somebody offended you or, or something happened. Maybe you're questioning God. What happens if you sit there by yourself? All of a sudden... Maybe your, your, your lack of belief and trust in God's ability becomes a God never did anything for me. Just because you sat there by yourself in your little stew pot feeling sorry for yourself. It doesn't work that way. But if we were around believers, just, just try saying that to a follower of Jesus Christ who loves Jesus Christ. God never will. <laughs> Knock it off. You guys ever seen that Batman meme? Robin starts to say something, Batman smacks. That's what, that's what we need to do to each other sometimes. Not literally, please don't smack your mother's something right. But sometimes we need the good old holy shake-up, right? Like, stop thinking these futile things because they're not true. God is able. God is willing. You just have to trust Him. And so in verses 14 and 15, He says, hold fast. For we have come to share in Christ. Amen? We have come to share in Christ. We are all family when it comes to God. Didn't he already establish that fact? We're adopted as sons and daughters into the family of God. We are made new. We're co-heirs with Christ. We are ambassadors with Christ. Can I get an amen? amen? Let's get excited about this, right? We are servants and friends of the Most High God. We share in His very life. We can get excited about these things. And he says, look, if we are all in this together, let us hold our confidence firm to the end. You know what the church needs today? Believers who stand up and say, I believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and I will not move. You know how the Protestant Reformation started? And the Dean of Worms, Martin Luther, said, Here I stand, I can do no other. Here I stand, I will stand upon the gospel of Jesus Christ as the only way by which a person can be saved. And I will stand no other other place. Amen? Amen? And he says, look, we need to hold our original confidence. And did you guys notice that there's, there's kind of this, this clause in there. He says, for we have come to share in Christ if indeed we hold. You guys catch that little word? This is conditional. If you want to share in the blessings and life of Christ, it is conditioned upon you holding firm in the faith. You know what that means? You cannot say, I walk with Jesus and live contrary to that, and then say, I share in the life of Christ. I'm not saying, we're not, we're not fruit inspectors. We're not, we're not going, oh, is that person, are they walking with Jesus? You ever had a bad day? How would you guys like to have everybody in your life judge you because of the one bad day you had? It happens. Bad days happen. We're not supposed to be fruit inspectors. What we're supposed to do is go down into the trenches with that person who's having a bad day and lift them up. And say, God still got you. Let's walk this together. God still has you. 
Let's hold faith so that we both share in the blessings of Jesus Christ and the life that he calls us to. He says, as it is said, today if you hear his voice, going back to Psalm 95, do not harden your hearts as in rebellion. If you hear the word of God, if this book speaks to us, which it does, don't harden your hearts against it. Don't go, hey, you know what? I just don't feel like trusting God today. It's too hard. It's not worth it. As we move down to verses 16 through 19, I just want to say this. Unbelief always leads to sin and judgment. This isn't just a hypothetical. This isn't just a scare tactic. When we don't trust God, it has consequences. What did he call that, that unbelieving heart? He called it evil. Why is it evil? Because it leads us away from God, not towards him. For It says, for who were those who heard and yet rebelled? Was it not all those who left Egypt by Moses? Who hardened their hearts towards God? He brings them back to Israel, their ancestors, the book of Hebrews, their ancestors, the people to whom they came from. And he says, look, was it not Israel? Was it not them who saw God's hand, as we read in, in Psalm 78, who did not, saw the works of God, and yet they hardened their hearts against God? And what happened? God was provoked against them for 40 years. Their unbelief brought judgment upon that nation for 40 years. Was it not those who sinned, whose bodies fell in the wilderness? Now this was not a hypothetical. This is not an analogy. The nation of Israel walked up to the Jordan River and said, No, we're not going. And God said, You're right. You're not going. That place that's flowing with milk and honey, the land of rest, the promised land, which I promised to your forefathers, you will not see. And you know what you will see? You will see desert floor for 40 years. You will pitch a tent, you will wake up, and there will be dry, stale bread for you to eat. Every now and again, I'm going to give you some birds. And that's it. That's all you get. Now, did they stop being the children of God? No, they just missed out on the blessing of God. And that is the moral of the story, is it not? Unbelief leads to judgment. And judgment doesn't necessarily say, hey, guess what? You're out of the, you're out of the, the blessing completely. No, he says you will miss the blessing though. When we choose to not trust God and we choose to walk differently outside of his word and outside of his will, guess what happens? He cannot bless you. He will not bless you. The only place that you find blessing from God is when we walk in the presence of God. That's it. Was it not those who sinned whose bodies fell in the wilderness? And to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest? But to those who were disobedient. They missed out on what could have been amazing. Can you imagine what it would have been like for those, those people? Just think about that. That entire generation that fell in the wilderness because of their unbelief. Imagine what it would have been like for them to share the stories with their children of how they crossed the Jordan River and how God took care of them and God blessed them and God gave us this land that we call home. But you know what they shared with their kids instead? I hope you do better than us. I hope you have more faith than us. And I hope you enjoy the blessing of God because you trust Him. Because we missed it. We missed the blessing of God in our life because of our unbelief. God was provoked against their unbelief. Why? Because unbelief doesn't come from Him. It comes from the enemy. We got to know that. And we can't leave this place and walk out of these doors thinking that, oh, I got this covered. I'm never going to have a spirit of unbelief. I'm never going to not trust God because let me tell you what, as soon as you say that, Satan's going to be there knocking. And he's going to be there saying, hey, you don't think you're ever going to not believe? Watch this. 
You know what? I hope that we can see how precious the body of Christ is. It is not only the avenue by which God works in this world, the local church. It is the avenue by which he uses his people to anchor us to himself. Through the study of his word, through prayer, through fellowship, for, through the, the mutual encouragement and building up of each other. For correction and rebuke when it comes to sin in our lives. The church is the mechanism that God has put in place to keep us tethered to him as we walk by faith. Right? You guys, how many of you guys like safety nets? I mean, I don't. When I roof, it's getting in the way. I'm just saying this. They, they have, yeah, nothing good. We, we get close to, when Dave and I do a roof, we get really close to Jesus. There, there's a lot of repentance of unknown sin. Um, but I mean, like when you, when you have a safety net, right? Isn't it kind of nice to go, oh, I, can, I can walk and I can do what I need to do because I know nothing's going to happen, right? That's the way it is when we walk in, in, in fellowship with Jesus with the body of Christ. We can walk with confidence knowing that our brothers and sisters have our back and that they're going to hold us accountable and that they're going to encourage us and they're going to push us towards Christ, right? That's why we come on a Sunday morning, isn't it? This isn't a religious activity. This is a place where we come and we meet with Jesus and we meet with each other so that we can focus our hearts before we go back out into this world to serve our King and Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. This is why we're here. Not for any other purpose. And I hope that when you come here on a Sunday morning or a Wednesday night or you get together with other believers for coffee, that you guys find a way to encourage each other. I've seen, I'm just going to share a couple stories. I've been, I've had the opportunity of, of working with some people over the past few months and, and uh, I will say firsthand, when you isolate yourself and you think you don't need anybody else, you will fall. You will give in to temptation you will go into sin. I can say that with confidence. Two people I've been working with over the last few months, that is their story. That's their story. This way, you walk alone, you're going to fall alone. Nobody's going to be there to pick you up. But in the midst of that, it doesn't mean that God abandons us either. Did He not provide for Israel still? Mm -hmm. Sure, they missed the blessing, but God was still there with them. God never leaves nor forsakes us. And if you have friends that love you and care about you, they're going to come alongside you. They're going to pick you up and say, you know what, let's go. Let's do this. But you know what? Let them in. Let them in. Because in those same stories of the guys that I've been working with, let me tell you what, when they let people in, God does amazing things. Iron sharpens iron. Amen? Amen? And we need that in our lives. <laughs> Let's close in prayer. God, thank you so much for your love and your grace. Thank you for the opportunity, Lord, that we have to gather in your name. Lord, to live out the gospel of Jesus Christ daily. And God, I'm thankful, Lord, just as we read the Bible over and over again, that, that you remind us of just how careful we need to be. Lord, because we are all capable of having a heart of unbelief. But God, I pray that we would heed the warnings here, but we would also heed the exhortation to find people in our lives who can encourage us and build us up and hold us accountable for your namesake, for your glory, for our life with you. And so your son's name we pray. Amen.